Good morning. My name is Josiah, as Malcolm said. Um, it hasn't changed in the last couple minutes, as far as I know. Um, if I haven't met you before, I'd love to um, meet you after the service. Um, my wife and I have been a part of Mosaic since um, the beginning, um, which thankfully is not that long of a time. Um, it's about two years, and uh, it's just a real privilege to be here with you this morning. We're going to start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come um, to you and speak to you through your Son, and that your Spirit is with us and praying with us as we pray to you. We pray that today you would be with the preaching of your word, that people would hear you and encounter you in your word, not me. And um, I pray that I would get out of the way and that you would speak in your word. We pray that you would, um, as the Puritans pray, that you would pass through this congregation handing out bread that we need for the journey. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's said that in the height of the Trinitarian debates back in the 3rd and 4th century, that you couldn't walk through the streets of Byzantium without hearing lay people knowing all the terms of the debates. You would hear homoousios here and people debating about begotten and proceeding over here. And in our day and age, I don't think that we care about doctrine quite that much, unless you're my three-year-old niece. My three-year-old niece was eating dinner the other day with her five-year-old cousin. And they, were, they had been playing together great all evening, and they were sitting at their own little table. And my brother-in-law hears them just screaming at one another. And so he walks over to hear what they're screaming about. And both girls are on the verge of tears. And Ella, the, the cousin, screams at my niece, Emma, the father is, God is Jesus' father. To which my niece, Emma, replies, no, they're the same. <laughs> and I, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't think I've ever gotten that worked up about the Trinity before. We're in the middle of a series called Orthodoxy. Foundational Truths to Treasure. And I want to begin with the question, what is a treasure? I asked my daughter this this morning, and she said, a treasure is something valuable that you take care of, that you are willing to sacrifice for. That definition of treasure makes a lot of sense for a chest of, a buried tre treasure chest of gold and jewels, for a family heirloom, and even for a special relationship. But it seems rather vague, doesn't it, when we apply it to doctrines like the Trinity? Because that's how most of us think of the Trinity, isn't it? We think of it as a doctrine. It's something that describes God, that we say in our confessions, and that has to be argued and has to be proved. But this morning, I want you to leave convinced and overjoyed that the Trinity is much more than just a doctrine that we confess. As one of my favorite um, Reformed theologians said, the Trinity is the heart and core of our confession. It is the differentiating earmark of our religion and the praise and comfort of all true believers of Christ. The Trinity is the heart and core of our confession and our praise and our comfort because the Trinity is not just a doctrine. The Trinity is God himself. Therefore, to treasure the Trinity is to treasure God. To be comforted by God is to be comforted by the Trinity. And to misunderstand the Trinity is to misunderstand God himself. This morning, I could go through the biblical justification for the Trinity, we know that the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, so some have argued that it's just an invention of 3rd and 4th century theologians. And it is important to know the biblical justification for the doctrine. But you are never going to spend the time to look at that justification unless you are convinced that the Trinity is truly important. The Trinity has been the essential Christian confession for almost 2,000 years, yet most of us would struggle to articulate how it makes any real difference in our lives. This morning, I want you to see how our, albeit limited, understanding of the Trinity is a gift of God himself that is meant to comfort and encourage us and shape how we relate to God and others. So we're going to ask three questions, all right? Three questions. Why is the Trinity our treasure? How is the Trinity our comfort? And what does it mean to treasure the Trinity? Why is the Trinity our treasure? How is the Trinity our comfort? And what does it mean to treasure the Trinity? Oh, there. Yeah, it worked. That's good. All right. So first... Before we turn to the passage that Shirley read for us a few minutes ago, we need to flesh out what I was just saying. Why is the goal to treasure the Trinity? Why is the Trinity a treasure? The answer is that the Trinity is not a divine attribute or a doctrine. It is God himself, as he reveals himself to be, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, there's a difference between an attribute and a person. Last week, Slim preached about divine incomprehensibility. That is a divine attribute. It tells us something 
about God. Namely, that he is inherently different than us. And so we can only know him if he reveals himself to us, right? There's a difference, though, about knowing something about somebody and knowing someone. And you all know this is true, because you know how frustrated you get when someone makes assumptions about you or assumes that they know everything about you. So if somebody assumes that they know you because of your skin color or because of your job or because of your marital status or because of your political affiliation, and then they act like they just know you, you know how frustrated you get, right? To know someone requires knowing more than just facts. And if that's true, how do we come to know somebody? We come to know them through their self-disclosure. So let me provide an example. All right, here I am. You can look at me, all right? Now, if you were to describe me, it's different than knowing me. And that's really true in my case, because based solely on my appearance and my relatively neutral accent, you would probably assume that I am a white male from the West Coast, OK? And if you did that, if you assumed that, you'd, you'd be right. I was born in Stockton, California. I went to college in California. I worked as a civil engineer in California. But, and you can operate with me for a long time underneath that fundamental assumption. You could, operate, you could do that, in fact, until I were to tell you that I actually, when I was 13 months old, my parents moved to Kenya. And I grew up in Kenya for 17 years, all the formative years of my life. So that self-disclosure forces you to have to reevaluate what you thought you knew about me. Yet even knowing that fact doesn't mean you know me. So I was substitute teaching a class one time, and the professor introduces me and says, Here, here's Josiah, he's going to teach you Greek, and he's Kenyan. And that is absolutely incorrect. All right? I, I, I lived in Kenya. I was shaped by Kenyan culture and values. I spoke the language. I loved the country. I loved the people. I'm not Kenyan. And yet, I'm not American either really, right? I'm not American in the same way that somebody who grew up here their whole lives is. To call me either one of, one of those terms alone is to confuse an attribute for a person. To truly know me, you have to spend time with me and I have to open up to you. I have to reveal to you how my past growing up in a culture that's foreign to my parents shaped me. I have to reveal to you how I'm a mixture of multiple cultural influences. And that's true for any immigrant or third culture kid, yet to know one of us is not to know all of us. My wife is a third culture kid. Her, mo her mom's from Colombia, her dad's from Greece, and she hybridizes those identities really differently than I hybridize my own identities. To know me, you need to know how growing up in these cultures plays out in how I make tea, the lingo that I use, why I'm wearing bata bullets when I preach. You need to know how I feel like I can never fit in, how my identity creates insecurities in me that I've learned to cope with. But you're never going to learn those things apart from my self-disclosure. And the same is true for all of us. For us to be known in our complexities requires self-disclosure. And it's no different with God. It's no different with the creator of the universe. Indeed, it's even more true in his case because of his incomprehensibility. We can only know him at all if he reveals himself to us. And that's the point of Slim's sermon last week. And that's what makes the Trinity so amazing. Throughout the whole Bible, God progressively reveals himself to us. He begins by stressing that he is one, in contrast to all the pagan gods that Israel's neighbors worshipped. But throughout the Old Testament, we have hints that the reality is even more complicated. God describes his actions of his wisdom and his spirit as though they were persons themselves. And then when Jesus comes, it's like me telling you I'm from Kenya. It blows open, and it forces you to reevaluate what you thought you knew about God. But friends, what we're going to see when we look in our passage in John 14... Full disclosure, this is a long sermon. Preaching, the, preaching on the Trinity in one sermon is hard. So we're just going to hang, hang on, all right? The, the reality is that Jesus is not the culmination of God's self-revelation. Rather, it's when the Spirit is revealed as the God who dwells in us that we are forced to realize that God is three and one. This is a treasure because it is God's self-disclosure to you. As we discussed three weeks ago, when you look at creation, you can know that there's a God and that that God is powerful. But that's knowing about him, not knowing him. We only truly know God if he is personal and if he reveals himself to us. And when God does reveal himself, he reveals himself as Trinity. Thus, the Trinity is the God that we get to know, enjoy, and relate to. All right, so that's the first question. That's why the Trinity is a treasure. Second question, how is the Trinity our comfort? All right, good. Okay, as surely read, our text this morning is John 14. If you have a Bible, I'd, I'd encourage you to open it and follow along. It's always good to make sure that I'm not making stuff up. And um, hopefully the text will be on the screen here too. So John wrote this gospel 
towards the end of the first century. It's the last gospel to be written. And it was written to an audience that was struggling with conflict with those who were rejecting belief in Jesus. And the audience was struggling because the first generation of Christians have all just died. And Jesus still hasn't come back yet. So John is providing comfort for the audience by recording Jesus' conversation with the disciples after the Last Supper the night before he dies. I'm going to reread what, what Shirley read for us. So they've just left dinner, and Jesus turns to the disciples. He can tell that they're worked up, that they're emotional. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, and believe also in me. In, in my father's house, there are so many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Whoever comes to the Father except through me. So note how Jesus comforts the disciples. He says, believe in me just as you believe in God. Belief in God is rooted in God's trustworthiness. And so the disciples are to trust Jesus when he says he's going to come back. But the phrase believe in God, believe also in me means even more than that. It means when you believe in God, you are believing in me. And when you're believing in me, you're believing in God. Jesus is saying that he is God. And we know that that's true because of how the passage continues. I'm going to keep reading. We're now in verse 8. So Philip, the other disciple, says to Jesus, Lord, just show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus says to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? When Philip says in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us, what, what's Jesus' response? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus is saying that he, a person that the disciples could see and touch, is the very God whom they could not see and could not touch. He's the very God who made covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and who brought Israel out of Egypt, and he's now in the flesh talking to the disciples after dinner. And as amazing as that is, though, think about it. Is that actually comforting? I think it actually makes it worse for the disciples because it's one thing if your best friend is leaving. It's another thing if the God of the whole universe who is with you is going to be gone, right? Like, it's, it almost makes it worse. And, and the crazy thing is that when the disciples were struggling with the fact that Jesus was about to leave, the way that he comforts them is he says that it's better for him to go so they could receive the Spirit. John 14 through 16 is one big conversation, so I'm going to jump around in the conversation a little bit. So this next verse is from John 16:7. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus tells the disciples that when he's gone, a helper, a paraclete, someone who's going to mediate God's presence to the disciples, just as Jesus mediates the Father's presence. That helper is divine. For how else could his presence be better than Jesus's? And yet he's also personal. So let's hear these next verses, John 16, 8. And when the helper comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And John 15, 26. When the helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So this helper is both divine and personal because he does personal things. He judges, he convicts, and he reminds the disciples of what Jesus has said to them. Jesus is telling the disciples that just as he made known to them the Father, so the Spirit is going to make him known to them. So the amazing thing about this passage, what's really crazy about it, is that this passage is not in any of the other Gospels. Only John records this whole conversation. Why? It's because John's audience was like us, living in the absence of Jesus. You may have seen the TV show, The Chosen. If you haven't seen it, it's available for free on YouTube. At least it was a couple months ago. Um, it's a dramatization Dramatization. Dramatization of the Gospels. And it has some creative liberties. Um, but what makes the show so compelling is that it helps us to see the disciples and Jesus as real people whom we can relate to. In that way, it helps us to feel like we're a part of the story and that we can know Jesus better. And the show helps us to empathize with the disciples and to understand how difficult it would be to grapple with Jesus' death. 
as they're doing in our passage. But more than that, the show creates a longing to see and to touch and to speak to Jesus, doesn't it? When the first audiences heard John tell about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and healing sickness or what it was like to be in his presence, and then they considered their own, the persecution that they were suffering from and their own struggles with illness and suffering, don't you think that they would have been longing for Jesus to be there with them? And, and aren't, aren't we days the son is begotten and the father is neither? And we're not going to get into the difference with all those terms mean, okay? The, the point, though, is that there are differences between the members of the Trinity. They're not just modes of being. The analogy of water, that the Trinity is like water, it can be a gas, a, a liquid, or a solid, or that I, am like, I can be like the Trinity because I'm a father and a son and a husband all at the same time, those, those are heresies. There's an ancient heresy called modalism. It's modalism, Patrick. There's this great video, YouTube it. And um, the, 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 it's, it's all because it's an error, because it implies that, there's, that God just operates in different ways in different times. No, the three members are, are, are distinct, and yet they are one. And this relates to the, a big doctrine called inseparability. This is, the, okay, this is the most complex part of the sermon. Inseparability. That is when one member acts... The others all act too. So the Trinity is not a divide and conquer operation, even though that's how we think of it a lot of the time. The, we, we, we tend to think, well, the Father, he's the God of the Old Testament who related to Israel. And the, the Son, well, he's the God of the New Testament who redeems the church. And then the Spirit, he's the God of the post apostolic church who is with us today. The Trinity is not an assembly line where the Father does the first task, and then the Son does the second, and the Spirit does the third. Each member has unique functions, but they're all involved in every action of redemption. So that changes how we have to read the Bible. If we treasure the Trinity, because it's not just a divine attribute, but it's who God himself is, then we have to read the Bible not just Christologically, but Trinitarily. So when Slim last week, he preaches about, he preached from Exodus 3, 14 through 15. And this is a passage where God reveals himself to Moses and says, I am who I am, right? When we read that passage, we tend to think in our heads, well, that's the Father, no, that's the Trinity. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This passage tells us two things. One, when we pray, God listens. Because God makes sure that God listens. So say that again. When we pray, God listens. Because God makes sure that God listens. We have access to the throne of God by the blood of Christ. And so when Satan gets up there and accuses us before the Father and tells the Father that your sins are so significant that you shouldn't have access to God, the Son of God gets up from his seat right next to the Father and says, No, my righteousness and blood give him. Give this person access. But more than that, when you're at your weakest, when you are suffering, and when you don't even know where to start in your prayer, God himself prays for you. I mean, God himself is praying for you. All right, the saints, according to the will of God. This verse comes right before another verse that you've probably heard out of context. In the verse is Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. That is an amazing truth. But if you read that in context, how, why do we know that for those who love God, all things are going to work together for good? It's because God himself is praying for you according to his will, and his will for you is good. Now, to be clear, God defines our good rather differently than we do sometimes. Our good does not mean a life free from pain and sorrow. Rather, our good means access to the source of true joy and fulfillment, namely God himself. 
So when the triune God prays for you in your moments of weakness, what he is praying for is your good, that you would come to treasure him more and more as the source of your joy and satisfaction. On the one hand, the Trinity makes God so much bigger and incomprehensible. And on the other hand, it makes God so much more intimate and personal because he is with me and you in our hardest moments. We're interacting with the whole Trinity, praying to the Father, through the Son, and with the Spirit. And because of that, we know that our prayers are heard and they're answered in ways that are going to result in our ultimate good. Second, internal. 